Hello, my name is John Kunze. I'm a computer scientist who has been working with libraries, museums, archives, and data centers for the past 20 years. You may notice an unusual word, persistible, in this title instead of persistent. It's hard to talk about persistence when applied to identifiers because it's hard to forecast. If we check an identifier every day for 10 years, it might prove to have been persistent, at least in its first 10 years. It's easier to talk about an identifier as persistible. Anyway, more about that later. <clears throat> Why should we care about ARCs? The average lifetime of a URL was once said to be 100 days. At the end of its life, a URL link breaks, usually giving you the dreaded 404 not found error that most of us have seen. That's irritating for most of us, but it's a minor disaster for memory organizations. So ARCs can serve as robust links. The ARC scheme is one of five so-called persistent identifier schemes or PIDs, but there's been so much nonsense written about PIDs that we prefer the term persistible. Some of this is described in a Twitter thread called 10 Persistent Myths About Persistent Identifiers, available at the link using this example ARC or the QR code next to it. <clears throat> Every link is potentially persistent, but strangely, some people think it becomes a PID when it acquires some superficial syntax differences, such as the ARC colon in this example ARC, or when you see the domain name doi.org at the start of a URL. Syntax is neither magic nor a guarantee. It's never more than a suggestion that you might find this link to be more stable than the 99% of URLs that are produced without a thought for preservation. So-called PIDs break regularly by the hundreds of thousands, which is a normal part of providing a preservation service. Committed service providers will even repair some of those links. So syntax doesn't make it persistent, but just possibly persistible. The nonsense was in full bloom in the late 1990s, but it polluted the debate about the four proposed PID schemes. That is why the archival resource key or ARC identifier scheme was introduced in 2001. Here's what an ARC looks like. At first glance, it's a URL that carries this internal label. <clears throat> To the right, the five-digit name assigning authority number, or NAN for short, identifies the organization that created the ARC. Further right, the part after the NAN names the thing that the ARC is assigned to. To the left, the host name makes the ARC actionable or something you can click on. It's also known as the resolver. ARCs are unusual among persistent identifiers in allowing organizations to run their own resolvers. The part starting with the ARC colon is the core, globally unique identity. It doesn't depend on the host being available or on the future existence of the World Wide Web. In the previous example, you saw n2t.net, which is a global name to thing resolver. n2t is the main ARC resolver. So why doesn't it contain the letters ARK? Well, one goal of the ARC design was to break out of the silos and the walled gardens surrounding other identifier systems. So what got built was the name to thing resolver or N2T. The domain name N2T.net is good for short citation strings and true to its name, N2T also resolves hundreds of different identifier schemes. ARC organizations include a wide variety of memory institutions, nonprofits, for profits, and government agencies. A few are listed on this slide. What are ARCs used for? Well, here are some examples. The heaviest user of ARCs is the largest genealogical research organization called Family Search International. Next is the archive of all the source files for mainstream published content. Technically, they have over 40 billion ARCs, but apparently only 100 million of them are interesting externally. The Internet Archive has been assigning ARCs to scanned books since 2008. The Smithsonian is rapidly expanding their use of ARCs with a target of 100 to 150 million. The French National Library was an early adopter 
And here's a wonderful image depicting the biblical ark. Arks are also important for people, especially historical figures. For example, there's an ark for the 19th century mathematician Ada Lovelace, and her ark was assigned as part of the snack project, which is sort of like assigning orchids for a dead people. Here's a brief case study for the Internet Archives ARC implementation. Note their reserved NAN 13960. On the left is an example of a venerable library cataloging standard that has been digitized from paper and deposited in their text archive with an ARC. On the right is its metadata record, where you can see the ARC they assigned and its NAN inside the red rectangle. Note how different it is from the identifier field above it. In contrast, the ARC is opaque, which helps it age and travel well for external citation, even if it's awkward for backroom administrators. You can see a bunch of metadata above that, including two URN identifiers that came in with it. Best practice is to preserve all the identifiers you find. Here's an abbreviated history of PID schemes. Um, PEARLs fully embraced the URL. Meanwhile, URNs, DOIs, and handles got confused for a while, saying that all URLs are bad, until they reversed that position and fully embraced the URL. Meanwhile, the inventor of the web said basically, just use URLs and manage them carefully. <clears throat> ARCs agreed and said, go ahead and use URLs, but embed a distinguishing label to suggest persistible and include a globally unique identity separate from the domain name and from today's web protocols. Here's the grumpy old version, old person view of PIDs. Looking at this table, the big block of no answers in the first four rows tells us that no PID scheme helps you with all of the major and most of the minor causes of broken links. So why even bother? Well, some of the PID schemes are free, so there will be more money to spend on the real work of preservation. This is a reminder for many of you that a core PID technique is indirect identifiers which uses the web concept of redirects. First, here's normal direct access. A user clicks on a URL in the browser, which sends it to the web server appearing at the beginning of the URL, and a page is returned. With indirect access, the first server contact that says it doesn't know where the thing is, but returns a message that this other named server should have more information. This is web redirection, and it's like forwarding your mail to a new address. There could be a long chain of redirects all taking place behind the scenes and without the user being aware. If you buy into the idea that PIDs actually provide value, here are some details on things they might do for you. By an amazing coincidence, this table is quite flattering to ARCs. The bottom line is, always about cost. No organization pays for the right to create ARCs, PEARLs, or URNs in unlimited numbers. In the real world, or maybe just the academic world, PIDs that publishers use play a key role. When tenure and promotion hang in the balance, DOIs are the publisher's solution, and they are seen as a kind of badge of academic legitimacy. Pearls are free and are common in the semantic web. URNs are useful if you're a national library naming static assets in a nation that subsidizes URNs. They have the unique advantage of having an internet standard behind them, even if it is frequently abused by creators of bogus URNs. Handles are popular in certain European projects and have a nicely replicated resolver infrastructure also used by the DOI system. So they can be good if you can afford them. If you only have a couple dozen things to identify in a year, by all means, consider going to zenodo.org and assigning their subsidized DOIs. In summary, ARCs are similar to DOIs. They're both persistible identifiers for accessing content and metadata, and ARCs are found in many of the places where you'll find DOIs. 
In contrast, Arx comes with no fees, no limits on how many you can create, and no metadata requirements. From the beginning, Arx were designed to be decentralized and to identify any kind of thing, digital, physical, or abstract. Finally, it's important to note that there's no conflict using both ARCs and DOIs at the same time. This is quite common. For example, you'll find a mix of both at the Smithsonian, the British Library, and other national libraries. Here's a second use case, this one from the Smithsonian, whose NAN is 65665. I'm told by insiders that the technical challenge of ARCs was minor compared to getting over a dozen organizations within the Smithsonian to cooperate. You can see the Smithsonian NAN appearing at the beginning of each arc here. You can also see the wide range of object types, biological specimens, paintings, photos, and sculpture. Note the long opaque names they've assigned, which were generated using the UUID software that's found on nearly every platform. These unique names are long, unfortunately, but easy to generate. Very briefly, here's another view of ARC syntax. It shows more detail than last time, but right now I just want to highlight the role of the NAN or name assigning authority number. The NAN is a five digit number. NANs are opaque, which is good for longevity. But what if you want to know what's behind a NAN? In a browser's address bar, you can try truncating an arc so that it stops after its NAN, as shown in the yellow highlighting. This is a stub arc. If you hit enter, this lets you inspect the 12148 NAN. You can also try this with any other NANs. Or you could try backing off further so that the stub ends with just the ARK colon. And that will tell you about the ARC scheme. Finally, you can also replace that scheme with the name of any of the other 600 different schemes that N2T knows about, such as the Protein Data Bank. All those NAN results are pulled from the main NAN registry, which is a plain text file that you can look at directly in your browser. You use the QR code if you're interested. Here's what it looks like when you ask N2T to tell you what the NAN 12148 is. You get the record for the National Library of France, as well as when it was registered in 2005, and very importantly, where the N2T resolver should redirect incoming ARCs so that they get sent to the correct resolver. <clears throat> so the NAN has two purposes. It's a lookup key for the resolution reference point, and by defining a root of a global namespace, it isolates an organization's autonomy and responsibility for assignment of its arcs. That way, without interfering with anyone else's assignments, the organization can determine its own policies regarding identifier form, uniqueness, and reuse, similar to how it can assign URLs under its domain name in any way that it wants. Here's a link to the form you can use to request a NAN for your organization. If you want to practice using it, just indicate in the final comments that you're filling it out as a training exercise. A great deal has been written about opaque identifiers, which age and travel well, but they can be confusing because they reveal nothing about themselves to the user. One approach is to soften the pain by making them shorter and so more citation friendly, but shorter IDs come at a cost. An emerging trend is to use an opaque base identifier with lucid or non-opaque extensions. That can be okay because extensions are more transient than the base thing itself. For example, image thumbnails are upgraded to be higher resolution over the years to keep up with evolving demand. This slide lists some tools for generating opaque IDs that I won't be getting into. Back to details of ARC syntax, the special characters slash and period have reserved meanings in ARC suffixes. So that makes those characters effectively non-opaque. 
They help the recipient make inferences about one resource containing another or one resource being a variant of another. In a non-ARC URL, you might guess at similar interpretations, but in ARC-based URLs, the guesswork is gone. If you use those reserved characters, you are formally declaring that these relationships exist. There's a natural parallelism between ARC suffixes and the popular IIIF image standard API, uh, which needs to be able to address hierarchical subregions and variants. And this is connected to the next case study. study. This is for the French National Library, whose noun again is 12148. So in this example, this is an I, a IIIF compliant URL that they that requests the return from page 29, that's the F29 you see, of a specific rectangular region. Out at the end, you can see the request specifying full quality and the JPEG format. Arcs are flexible. You can throw them away, which is much easier if you have never told anyone about them. Arc metadata is uniquely flexible. Uh, for example, starting in the planning phase when it just needs an identifier so you can talk about it. Uh, we, After all, we name our children before they're born. We name our objects before they're born. Then at the moment of birth, uh, when we have a digital object, we might assign a redirection target as the one and only piece of metadata. Later, we might add draft metadata, uh, have it reviewed by others, released and edited again, et cetera. Persistence is not on or off. Whoops. It is nuanced. Ironically, preservation often involves change. Valuable objects tend to be complex, human-curated clusters of digital artifacts that curators are forced to change in order to keep up with changing technical, policy, security, and legal requirements, as well as user expectations. An arc should lead to three things, to the identified thing, whether it's digital, physical, or conceptual, to metadata about it, uh, and to a nuanced persistent statement that sets expectations. Here's an example showing an ARC metadata request, which is created by appending a query string consisting of question mark info uh, appended to it. The last line says that persistence information is unavailable, unavailable for this particular record. Suffix pass-through is a feature that a web server can choose to support in order to greatly increase the number of identifiers that it can forward. It dramatically reduces the burden of maintaining identifiers by permitting one identifier to stand in for millions. The way it works, given a URL for the stored identifier, if an ARC arrives with an appended suffix, N2T will reappend it, or pass it through to the destination during resolution. This is critical for IIIF applications since the many addressable subparts and formats don't all have to be separately registered, maintained, and possibly paid for. And this final case study is with a is a visualization from Dave Glace of the US National Science Foundation iSamples project. It allows us to visit the South Pacific island of Morea in French Polynesia. Each of the colored points represents a physical sample, and the towers indicate that many samples were collected at the same location. Each sample point has an ARC identifier, which is displayed when mousing over it. Clicking on one of the points brings up summary metadata, which allows you to link back to the original collection. Following that link to the Smithsonian, you can find more details about the specimen with cross-references to analyses, publications, and other material. The interlinking is done with millions of ARCs, and the number of participating collections should grow significantly as the project continues. It's all part of the NSF iSamples project, which assigns identifiers to biological specimens, rocks, and archaeological artifacts.
Thank you, John. Um, any questions? I have one question. Ah, do you? Yeah. Um, I guess, <laughs> sorry, hi, I'm on here. Um, I had a question about, um, actually, I don't know if you can hear me. I'll have to type it after I say it. Um, if arcs could be withdrawn or edited or changed, um, like, is, like, would there be, like, a history or a re revision history to arcs? Well, ARCs are not centrally managed. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. Um, there's some delay. So they're not centrally managed. Therefore, it's not a property of the ARC scheme. It's a, a that's a property of the uh, a particular implementation. Yeah, my question was about the persistence information that is added. Uh, what exactly could that, because in the example you showed it was an, um, or there was no persistence information, what could did this be? Yeah, it's a, there's a longer version of this uh, presentation, which gets into quite a bit of uh, sort of proposed terminology. The persistent statements are um, are not finalized, but uh, a great deal of vocabulary has been set up for around things like content variance. Uh, that's the Um, Marcos is asking if you could use hashes as uh, PIDs. Yes, you can use hashes as PIDs. Um, they have a, there's a, there's a very popular approach to preservation, which suggests that these frozen bit streams, these are bit streams that never change, um, can be very usefully identified with content hashes. But the problem with that is, the, the problem with that is that th they, um, the, the, some of these bit streams will gradually become less and less relevant as the content changes. And that has gone into in this larger presentation. I'm going to stop there because I'm hearing my answer at, with uh, about uh, 10 seconds delay and I can't quite compete with it. I'll stop. Thanks to John. <laughs>